from the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Native American tribes take the battle for their sacred land to the nation's capital. We'll look at what one tribe is doing to protect its heritage. Plus, licensing requirements for midwives has led to a lawsuit against the state. We'll hear what the controversy is all about. And the big hubbub over Gus Gus comes to a close. Find out how a baby goat snatched from the Arizona State Fair took the internet by storm. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News. I'm Genesis Monserati. And I'm Erica Lang. Thanks for joining us. The Arizona Association of Midwives has filed a lawsuit against the Arizona Department of Health Services. Cronkite News reporter Angie Schuster was at the rally outside of the DHS building where the announcement was made. The Arizona Association of Midwives says there are currently 74 licensed midwives in the state. 19 of those have pending enforcement actions against them by the Arizona Department of Health Services for not following department rules. Rules that they say infringe on their midwife duties. The announcement about the lawsuit came at around 12.30 today. Wendy Kleckner, president of the Arizona Association of Midwives, told the group they had filed a lawsuit against the state. About three years ago, there was a, uh, a bill that was passed to increase our scope of practice and de decrease our burden, both of which have not been done. Um, there are many things that actually decreased our scope that made it more restrictive for us to practice and a lot more regulation. The suit names the Arizona Department of Health Services, Attorney General Mark Brnovich, and DHS Director Kara Christ as defendants. Lee Soderbloom says she is one of the midwives facing action from the Department of Health. She had a client whose pregnancy ultrasound did not match with her due date calculations. They said that we must use, by definition, the gestation is by last normal menstrual period, which meant that I was non-compliant with my rules, even though it was compliant with every other known policy and what basically an OB would provide. Mandated vaginal exams and denial of care by their midwife after six weeks postpartum are just a few of the reasons that midwives and their consumers are angry at the Department of Health Services. Adriana Benitez is one of Soderbloom's clients and had preterm bleeding in labor. She delivered in a hospital. The association says if there is a transfer of medical care, midwives are no longer allowed to treat their clients. But Benitez said most doctors won't see women postpartum if they didn't provide prenatal care. I even called an, uh, another OB who I had seen with my two other children, uh, trying to get in a, a postpartum appointment with him. And in the initial phone call, they said, no, you didn't um, have prenatal care with us. You, we didn't deliver. The Arizona Association of Midwives say they hope this lawsuit will get rid of the, quote, red tape that ties midwives' hands. The Department of Health Services declined to comment. Angie Schuster, Cronkite News. The Arizona elections are over, and Arizona voter registration numbers are up by more than 47,000 since July, bringing Arizona to nearly 3.3 million registered voters. Arizona Secretary of State Michelle Reagan says registration numbers may continue to grow heading into next year's presidential election. Hundreds of tribal leaders gathered today in Washington for the 7th White House Native American Summit, where administration officials laid out a raft of initiatives on everything from protecting sacred sites to helping bring high-speed internet to tribal homes. Cabinet-level officials met throughout the day with tribal officials at the event, which was scheduled to be capped off by an address by President Barack Obama. While most tribal leaders were in Washington to listen, some came to be heard. The San Carlos Apache were among tribes who addressed a House committee about the controversial land swap involving the Oak Flat area. Charles McConnell is live from our Washington Bureau with the details. What began as a fight for a few Arizona tribes has turned into a global movement to protect land sacred to these tribes and Mother Nature. I'm here as a representative of over a million people including nearly 200,000 in the U.S. who are calling on Congress to do the right thing. The right thing, these people say, is repealing the swap of land in southeastern Arizona to a huge copper company. That deal with Resolution Copper was attached to last year's defense spending bill. However, with this midnight rider that authorized the South Arizona land exchange, a dangerous precedent has been set for all of Indian country. A precedent, tribal officials say, that threatens their way of life. Protecting sacred native lands from desecration and destruction is vital to the continued protection of our religions and our way of life. San Carlos Apache tribe leader Terry Rambler says they must protect their heritage. We need to stay as close as possible to our ancestral lands. 
Since we are not going anywhere, we are bound to protect these places, places like Oak Flat. Opponents say they are also worried about environmental devastation. Just as we would expect that no woman be violated, we have the same expectation for Mother Earth. Resolution Copper insists the mine will be safe and beneficial. In a statement, the company said the mine will supply a domestic source of copper, create 3,700 jobs, and provide $61.4 billion in economic value over the life of the mine. The tribes say the land is more than just a source of profit. Living on our land with our families is more important to us Native people than any career or job opportunity. Chairman Rambler says he is optimistic that the swap will be repealed. And Representative Grijalva announced yesterday that Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont will introduce a companion bill in the Senate. Reporting live in Washington, Charles McConnell, Cronkite News. The Navajo Nation president has okayed the purchase of land in northwest New Mexico. Tribal officials say that land could be used for a new health care facility. The Navajo Nation will use money from its land acquisition trust fund to make the purchase. And there's good news tonight. Gus Gus, the missing baby goat, is back with his mother. The hashtag find Gus Gus was trending all over Arizona. As Sydney Glenn reports, there's still confusion over just how all of this happened. An officer is taking down a statement this morning for a kidnapping, but not your average kidnapping. The kid in this case is really a kid, a baby goat. Gus Gus, a three week old pygmy goat from the Arizona State Fair, was taken around 5 p.m. last night. So basically you would have had to have come over here, scooped down, picked him up, stuffed him in your jacket or your purse and walked out. Everyone I spoke to in both the fair and petting zoo industry said this is almost unheard of. I've been in the fair industry since the late 80s, which is a really long time, and never heard of anything like this happening. I'm here with Custard, baby Gus Gus's mother, who I've been told has been in distress all morning since baby Gus Gus was taken from her. Gus Gus's life was at risk. His handlers say he couldn't have survived more than a few days without his mother's milk. It, it boggles my mind that someone would think it would be okay to take a baby from its mother. But it looks like the kidnapper had a conscience. In Phoenix, Sydney Glenn, Cronkite News. Now keepers say the baby was located around 2 this afternoon when a man walking his dog spotted Gus wandering along a canal in North Phoenix. He then took the goat to a local pet smart. Gus Gus is back home with the Great American Petting Zoo where he is in the pen with his mother. Refugee youth in Phoenix have a new place to turn for help. Coming up on Cronkite News, one center is opening its doors and providing hope to children who have crossed the border. And protesters are calling for answers after medical examiners still haven't been able to identify bodies found along the border. At ASU, we believe the most important semester is the one that starts after you get your diploma, the one called life. So we work hard to help our alumni thrive, teaching them the importance of not only achieving their goals, but exceeding them. With innovative programs that embrace hands-on learning, that encourages real-world growth, our alumni know it can be the education of a lifetime, for a lifetime. For more information, asu.edu. This is a box, a box that shows you a world beyond your own. It was just a box, but the world has changed, and so have we. And now the box can be almost any size or shape. And you decide what you want to explore, anytime, place. Break out of the box with PBS. Are you a news junkie, history buff, science or nature lover? Then discover a world, an entire channel devoted to bringing the world home to Arizona. Watch 8 World on Cox 88 or over the air via antenna on 8.3. To find out how to tune into 8 World for your satellite or another cable provider, visit azpbs.org slash world or call 602-496-2308. Discover your world. 8 World. My child who's watching Super Y and it said, what letter makes the sound err? And my two-year-old is jumping up and down going, R, R, R. <laughs> I love that. 
I wish I knew the genius that came up with Dinosaur Train. I mean, what little boy especially doesn't like dinosaurs and trains and to put them together in one show? My family does without a lot of stuff, but I would be horrified if we had to do without PBS. Refugee youth can now find shelter at the Phoenix Dream Center, a faith-based nonprofit organization. The center has helped children who have aged out of foster care and victims of sex trafficking. With the influx of young adults crossing the border, the center decided to rise to the occasion and help refugees. Since expanding their mission four months ago, the Dream Center has sheltered a dozen teens from Central America, Rwanda, and Mexico. Jose Montoya came to the center in August. Like many refugees, he risked his life, traveling through dangerous terrain to reach the U.S. At first, you're afraid, but once you get started, there's no turning back. There will always be that because there will always be other countries that um, are poverty ridden, you know, they're, they're poverty stricken countries where these young people are growing up and parents who desire the very best for their children. Refugees at the center are able to stay for up to a year. They take classes, learn English and receive legal aid. After years of secret negotiations, the United States has finally released a complete text of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It involves 11 other countries on the Pacific Rim, including Mexico and Japan. Trans-Pacific countries support almost 300,000 jobs in Arizona alone. Arizona exports everything from melons to car audio, to car audio equipment to pet food, and the deal has sparked controversy in both parties. Opponents worry that it could spike the cost of drugs and promote bad labor conditions. A new development this week in the case of the 43 missing Mexican students. Independent investigators exhumed the body of 22-year-old Julio Cesar Mondragón after finding inconsistencies in his autopsy. Mondragón is among six students killed the night the 43 students disappeared. His remains showed signs of torture. Miguel Ángel Mendoza Zacarías. Justicia. Abelardo Vázquez Penitén. Justicia. Protesters in both Mexico and the U.S. marched in September to demand justice on the one-year anniversary of the disappearances and deaths. The Mexican consulate in Phoenix was the site of one of the demonstrations. Relatives of the missing and murdered students are working with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to independently investigate the cases. More than 100 people marched in Tucson to remember migrants who lost their lives crossing the border. Many died in the desert. The Pima County Medical Examiner's Office has struggled to identify their remains. As Cronkite News reporter Fan Wang reports, part of the problem is watching remains. The annual pilgrimage in Tucson is a memorial for migrants who lost their lives in the Arizona desert. Every cross that we carry that says desconocido or desconocida, it's an unknown identity, but they're full human beings. Derechos Humanos has organized the pilgrimage for the past 15 years. The crosses represent 137 migrant lives lost this past year. The event coincides with Day of the Dead celebrations this time of the year. We celebrate those lives, we bring them back to life. And they ask those who perish in the desert to come back and lead their strength on earth. And you can see that here on where some of the ribs are attached. Since 2000, the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office has received about 2,400 remains of suspected border crossers. It's more than any other single jurisdiction in the U.S. The medical examiner determines the cause of death but identifying the victims is more challenging. That is essentially the nutshell of the problem that we have. It's not necessarily determining the cause and manner of death. That's relatively easy. It's figuring out um, uh, who they are and then trying to get those remains back to family members. The medical examiner's office has now been able to identify 35 percent of those remains. That's about 850 people and there is not enough space to keep the remains indefinitely. If it doesn't look like we're going to be able to identify someone in a timely manner, then we can't keep those remains here forever because we run out of, we have storage issues. The cases remain unsolved because the remains often cannot be matched to missing persons reports. The families don't know where to begin, they don't have the resources to begin looking. Human rights groups such as Derechos Humanos have stepped in to take phone calls from families searching for their missing loved ones. 
Their 24-hour hotline is hearing from about 100 families every month. Most of the calls are from Texas, followed by Arizona. The five-hour pilgrimage ends at a historic San Javier mission. Death is part of now our alleged deterrence policies that doesn't deter anybody who's fleeing violence or hunger or seeking to be with their families. People lay down the crosses, adding them to the more than 2,000 that represent migrants who lost their lives in Arizona during the past 15 years. In Tucson, Fan Wang, Crank High News. Scientists are looking for ways to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. But coming up on Cronkite News, what researchers in Arizona are doing to actually take CO2 out of the air. And the first snowfall of the season means business owners and Flagstaff are getting ready for more customers. Growing up, my family had no real idea of where we came from. It's kind of like being in a fog because you feel like a piece of you is missing. What is the rest of my story? I saw African American Lives on PBS. I love the series, and there was a DNA kit that you could order to find out your African ancestry. And so I really got excited. My DNA results said that I was from Ghana. Wow. It just really opened me up to a whole new world, so I went ahead and started doing things. Now my mission is to write stories, to have something to pass down to the next generation. It's important to know where you're from and to tell your children, teach them that. PBS helped me to go on a journey to discover who I was and that journey will never end. This is a box, a box that shows you a world beyond your own. It was just a box, but the world has changed and so have we. And now the box can be almost any size or shape. And you decide what you want to explore. Any time, any place. Break out of the box with PBS. For years, scientists and environmentalists have focused on reducing carbon dioxide emissions, but new technology shows that what can't be reduced could actually be removed. Audrey Wheel shows us that some of the leading research in CO2 removal is happening here in Arizona. The Center for Negative Carbon Emissions at Arizona State University is working on air capture technology, which is exactly what it sounds like, a way to capture existing CO2 directly from the air. We develop materials which have the feature that they can bind CO2. So they are a little bit like leaves on a tree. As the air blows over those surfaces, uh, the CO2 attaches itself to it. The materials work on a moisture swing, attracting CO2-filled air when they're dry, and then separating and releasing an enriched concentration of that CO2 when they become wet. The enriched CO2 has several uses, like feeding algae. Uh, those algae could then be used to make biofuels, and that's part of the idea there. So you could have fuels without taking petroleum. The center's goal is to counterbalance the current 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. But Lackner says the focus still needs to be on reduction first, leaving removal as a backup plan. In some ways, air capture is the capture of last resort. If you can't think of any better way, you have a guarantee that you can do that. And I think that's why it's so powerful. But the idea is still new, and technology is not yet commercially available. Air capture is not a technology which is on the shelf, but it's also not so hard that we couldn't do it. It's something which is recent in its development, but uh, give it a few years and the technology will be demonstrated. And when it is demonstrated, it could have a big impact. And if we're able to create a system where you could pull carbon dioxide concentrations out of the air, make a saleable product, uh, I think you're benefiting your environment, you're benefiting your economy, and you're benefiting your community with all the things that you're doing. The center isn't the only place interested in air capture technology. Other companies across the country and even around the world are looking into similar ideas. But the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality says as far as it knows, none of these technologies are on the market yet. In Phoenix, Audrey Wheel, Cronkite News. 
A court case over a planned freeway extension in Phoenix is going to take more time. A federal judge granted both sides extensions in the South Mountain freeway case to produce documents and court filings. The freeway extension is being challenged by the Gila River Indian community and other environmental groups. Construction has been cleared to start in 2016. A mulch fire erupted in North Phoenix at a plant nursery and has burned about eight acres of land. The inferno broke out Wednesday afternoon due to the flames triggered by the nursery's dumping grounds made up of trees, plants, and mulch. Firefighters trekked in tons of water to prevent the fire from reaching the freeway. No damages were reported, but officials say the fire could burn for several days. Yesterday's storm in Flagstaff brought record-breaking snow, according to the National Weather Service in Flagstaff. They received about 10 inches. Our Cronkite News reporter Lauren Michaels explains how all the snow will affect tourism this wintry season. Here in Flagstaff, they did have a significant amount of snowfall to start their season, and many residents here are starting to prepare for the tourists arriving, especially this year's Snow Bowl and all the surrounding businesses. Snow, snow, and more snow. Flagstaff has transformed into a winter wonderland. And Missy Heal, a local business owner who has worked at this restaurant for 26 years, is ready to see more tourists. You can definitely tell around town that it's busier. Um, it seems like if it snows on the weekends, we're not as busy as when it snows on the weekdays. And that could be because of Flagstaff's winter attractions, like the Arizona Snow Bowl. This year, they have invested $2 million, installing a new chairlift on Humphreys Peak and expanding infrastructure to allow snowmaking on Ridge Trail, giving skiers a chance to be on the trail all season this year. But can they quickly make this revenue back? We don't necessarily count our successes in revenue dollars. Uh, it's really in skier count. And in a year like this, you can see anywhere from 175 to 200,000 visitors or even sometimes more. He looks forward to meeting those winter travelers and keeping up with the Flagstaff locals. I love the people here. I, I moved away for a little bit and it just wasn't the same. And she could see bigger crowds. With this year's forecast calling for a strong El Nino, more snow than normal is expected. To see this kind of weather come in this early in the season just gets us super jazzed. This is the stuff we live for. This year's weather patterns due to El Nino has brought Flagstaff more rain than usual. And because of that, the Arizona Snow Bowl will be opening a few days earlier on November 20th. Here in Flagstaff, I'm Lauren Michaels, Cronkite News. The Phoenix Zoo is getting a new exhibit. That's right. The new tiger habitat opens to the public this weekend. But coming up on Cronkite News, we've got a sneak peek of the tiger's new home. Fridays, it's at Cronkite News, your social sharing connection where you choose the news. Facebook likes and shares, tweets, retweets, and favorites. YouTube views and subscriptions. We're watching you watch us. From our digital home at cronkitenews.azpbs.org to your television, web browser, or mobile device. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Then join us for at Cronkite News, our weekly refresh, each Friday at 5 on Arizona PBS. The easiest and best way to support eight Arizona PBS is by becoming a sustaining member. Your monthly contribution of $5 or more comes directly from your bank account or credit card, so you know your membership is always current. It also means no more renewal notices in your mailbox. So more of your dollars go to the programs you love. It's convenient for you, greener for us, and better for the planet. Become a sustaining member today. Hi, I'm Judy Woodruff, co-anchor of the PBS NewsHour. Preparing the next generation of journalists has never been more important than it is now. With its groundbreaking partnership with Arizona PBS, the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at ASU is revolutionizing journalism education to provide students with a real opportunity to work and learn under the supervision of veteran journalists, producers, directors, and editors on newscasts, investigative stories, and documentary productions. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS, reinventing journalism education in the digital age. A project that has been in the works since last spring opens up. The Phoenix Zoo reveals the new tiger exhibit to the public this weekend. Reporter Devin Conley got a sneak peek. I'm standing at the Phoenix Zoo where their new exhibit, Eye of the Tiger, is set to open. Behind me, the exhibit is around 20,000 feet for the tigers to roam. 
Zookeepers say the new enclosure will help make the tigers more comfortable. This is actually better for the animals because we can actually exhibit both animals at the same time. Uh, because tigers are solitary, they actually, we rotated them on exhibit, so now they can actually have outside space, large outside space at the same time, so we don't have to have a cat inside. While the exhibit was built for the tigers, it had spectators in mind. It's also good for the visitors because now the visitors can see both cats at the same time, so it improves um, uh, viewing opportunities for the people that come in to see our, our ambassadors of our species. Farrington says it has multiple windows and viewing areas to enhance the zoo goers' experience. The sanctuary is divided to keep the cats separate. However, this will not block spectators' views. There is a main gazebo to view the two yards, as well as a smaller viewing area for a different angle. While before spectators had to view the tigers from a distance, now the only thing standing between them is four panes of glass. Well, I think that people will really like being able to see the tigers up close now, because before you always had some distance and you couldn't get a real feel for how big they actually are. And now that they can potentially come right up next to you on the um, windows, I think it's going to be really great. The exhibit is set to open this Sunday for the public. In Phoenix, Devin Conley, Cronkite News. And if you're a member of the Phoenix Zoo, you can get a special preview on Friday and Saturday. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's a look at what's next on Arizona Horizon and PBS NewsHour. On the next Arizona Horizon, hear from the director of the state agency that handles Arizona's safety net and see how one man didn't let a major operation stand in the way of his dreams. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next news hour, an inside look at rebuilding America's nuclear weapons. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.